So without any further comment, let me uh, welcome our speaker tonight, Dr. Maya Mayam. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Skip. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's really a great pleasure uh, to be in Portland uh, for this uh, lecture series. Um, you know, I've been traveling all over the country uh, giving, you know, talks, but mostly in uh, professional conferences. Uh, but what uh, ISEP and Terry Bristol and, and Skip Rung and all the partners are doing here is, is truly remarkable. Uh, bringing uh, good speakers on forums like this, you know, to transmit information. Uh, you know, this is the kind of things that, uh, you know, make uh, Portland a great American city. So I, I want to congratulate all of them, you know, for the extraordinary efforts, you know, that, uh, that they've been putting in this uh, lecture series. Uh, so today what I'm going to do is to, uh, to give a brief introduction to you about this uh, technology of the 21st century, you know, nanotechnology. The title of my talk is Nanotechnology, the Next Frontier. I can't remember whether it was Terry or, you know, who, uh, someone else who told me that, uh, you know, when you talk to a, uh, an audience in a public uh, forum like this, so the rough rule of thumb is that actually one third of what you got to say to them, everybody has to understand. You know, the, the other one third, you know, they can have some, you know, feel for what you're talking about. And the last one third, if it goes way over their head, you know, that's okay. And um, so, so, so that's a rough rule of thumb that, uh, you know, somebody gave me. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how this is going to work out. I'll let you be the judge of it, okay? But I, I'll, I'll try to keep it, you know, fairly simple and, and straightforward. Um, so just a, a comment on the, on the uh, flag that I have on the... Uh, Tidal view graph, uh, this is uh, uh, the carbon nanotube, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit later on. Uh, the reason I put this uh, on the title list is not only because it, it looks pretty neat, but this was made actually in my lab uh, um, at NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley by a 16-year-old uh, in high school, in a sophomore. This was about five years ago. Uh, he spent a summer working in my lab and I taught him how to do, you know, carbon nanotubes and uh, uh, he not only learned how to grow carbon nanotubes, he actually uh, used a scanning electron microscope. Unfortunately, I can't tell you whether this was an FEI one or, 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 or some other uh, microscope, I apologize. And, um, but I think more than likely it is actually an FEI microscope because I'm from the U.S. government and we have a rule that actually you cannot buy anything foreign, so it probably is an FEI. Um, SCM. Anyway, so he, he used that and, and he, he made this thing. Currently, he's a, a senior at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so I'll come back and talk about the carbon nanotube a little later. So a good place to start is to talk about nanoscale. Okay, so what is a nanometer? A nanometer is, is one billionth of a uh, meter. Okay, so just to put it in context, so I'm going to uh, show a few things. So, you know, this girl is uh, about four feet, and that's 1.209, you know, meters, or in other words, 1.209 billion nanometers, okay? So these cats are about you know, a foot tall, which is, um, you know, three tenths or close to you know, 0 0.3048, you know, meter, or in other words, actually, in a 304.8 million nanometers, okay? So we are going down the scale. The next one is an ant. Okay? It's about five millimeters, which is, you know, five million nanometers. Keep going down, a human hair, you know, on the average, okay, different people have, um, you know, different thickness. I'm beginning to lose my hair. Terry has already lost most of his. And um, uh, so on the average, actually, is 10 micron wide on the average. You know, that's the thickness of a human hair. So that's 10,000 nanometers. Um, a DNA is uh, 2.5 nanometers wide. And then finally, if you were to take, you know, 10 hydrogen atoms, 
and stick them right next to each other like 10 golf balls and that covers one nanometer, okay? So that's how small things are. So hopefully, you know, this context actually gives you an idea what a nanometer length scale is, okay? So the next one is, then now that you understand what nanoscale is, the next question is, you know, what is nanotechnology? You know, obviously, you know, by now you get the picture, it has got to do with, you know, playing around with things at the nanometer length scale, okay? So do we, you know, we are playing around with things, but not just simply playing around with things, but making things which are useful, okay? Uh, I should have made the useful in bold and red and italics because, you know, that's, uh, you know, I can't get the message across better than that, basically because some of you may have, you know, read the uh, book, uh, you know, Pray by Michael Creighton and uh, um, it talks about all kinds of, you know, gray goo and all kinds of nonsense, you know, and uh, wait until the movie comes, actually, that would get even bigger press, okay? So, you know, people in Intel and FEI and all the companies across the world, actually, we are trying to, you know, we are working very hard to make things which are useful, okay, useful things by manipulating matter at the nanometer length scale, okay, the, the scale that I was talking about, approximately one to 100 nanometers. So that's only the beginning, that's only half the story, okay. So necessarily nanotechnology has to do with you know, uh, manipulating matter at the nanometer length scale. But more importantly, it is also about taking advantage of properties that change because you are going from a big, you know, bulk scale to nano scale. So you are asking, going to ask me a question, oh, so do properties change when you go from big size to small size? The answer is you know, absolutely, okay? I'll come back and give you some examples. So for the time being, just take my word for it. I'll come back and give you some proof, okay? So the important thing is, you know, half the story is actually manipulating matter at the nanometer length scale. The other half of the story, which may be even more important, is taking advantage of the novel or unique properties that arise because you are going from big scale to small scale, okay? So that completes the story. But then there is just one other thing, okay? What you are trying to make, does it really have to be small? The object that you are creating, does it have to be small? You know, the answer is no. Because a lot of useful things actually don't have to be tiny, you know, unless we plan to shrink ourselves, okay? I mean, we are who we are, we are big, and, you know, if you have to use, you know, make use of a lot of things, you know, the objects have to be something that we can touch and use and feel and so on and so forth. So the object that you create does not have to be, the ultimate object that you create, the product that you create does not have to be nano. It could be micro or it could be macro. See, eventually you can use a nano material and assemble a body panel or an aircraft wing, okay, which, which is going to be the size of a regular aircraft, okay. So the object that you build, the product that you build, yeah, can be anything, you know, much bigger than nano, okay. That makes a lot of sense, right? And so, now the next question is, what is so special about nanoscale? Okay, the first thing is actually, you know, this is a simple exercise and, um, you know, for the students. You take a cube, okay, so you know the surface area. Surface area of one side is, a, you know, if the, if the, if the, each side is A, then the area of uh, uh, that one side is A square. And this being a square, you have six sides, so it's six A square, okay. So now you just cut this in the middle, okay. Now, what it is, is you are creating one surface, extra surface at the bottom and one extra surface on the top, okay? So now you go from, you know, 6A squared to a larger surface area. And then you cut this actually now into another, you know, two pieces, cut this into another two pieces, okay? So you keep creating more and more and more surface area. So the bottom line is nanomaterials for, for the given volume, they have a large surface area, okay? So the area to the volume ratio keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger when you go to smaller size, okay? So that's the first thing that you want to keep in mind. So that is something special. The second thing is, in a little bit about, uh, about you know, chemistry, okay? You take an uh, iron particle, so in this case, I'm just, you know, something like a 30 nanometer iron particle, okay? And look at this picture. What it is is, 
uh, nearly about um, only 5% of the atoms are on the surface, okay? And all the other atoms are inside. On the other hand, now you go to uh, something like a three nanometer particle that nearly has, you know, 50% of the atoms on the surface and then the rest of them inside, okay? So you might wonder, what is the difference between an atom on the surface and the atom on the, in a, um, in, inside? An atom completely inside, it is surrounded by its neighbors, okay? So chemistry-wise, basically, all its, it is bonded to its neighbors. So all its electrons and everything, you know, they are shared by the neighbors, okay? So think of it as like a happy atom, okay? On the other hand, the atom on the surface, it has, it has got this, you know, sharing thing going on on the inside, but in, on the outside, it is not sharing anything with anybody. So this is kind of a, think of it like a restless atom, okay? And the restless atom is an active atom, okay? So that's the difference. So now, when you go smaller and smaller size, more and more atoms are on the surface, and the atoms are on the, you know, on the surface are more reactive, okay? So that is the second thing that is special about nanoscale. And then the third one is quantum mechanics, you know, plays a, a very large role, okay? And the quickest way for me to explain quantum mechanics is actually, uh, um, in fact, one of my colleagues a long time ago drew a nice picture. I wish I had that. What it is is, you know, think of yourself actually walking in your living room towards the wall in front of you, okay? You keep on walking, actually, you're going to hit yourself in the wall, probably you'll get a bump or a bruise or whatever. You're not going to go through the wall. Okay? I mean, that's a classical thing. Quantum mechanics is nothing, you know, it's, it's not classical, it's completely different. Quantum mechanics tells you, actually, under certain conditions, okay, I don't have time to go through all those conditions, you know, some has got to do with your initial velocity and some has got to do with the velocity you're going through. It tells you that actually if you keep on walking, you, it also has got to do with how thin the wall is, you will have a chance to go through the wall. Okay, so that's, that's quantum mechanics. Basically, you know, replace yourself with an electron and uh, replace a wall, you know, with the energy barrier of a, of a semiconductor like silicon. And, uh, you know, going through the wall is the same as what the physicists call tunneling. Okay, it's just the, like the word implies going through a tunnel. Okay, so that's quantum mechanics. Okay, so that is my 30 second quick uh, description of, you know, quantum mechanics, okay? And so these are all the things that are special about nanoscale, okay? So now that we know something special, the next question is, um, uh, I did say something about these properties all change when you go from, you know, the big scale, bulk scale, you know, to nanoscale. And these properties are physical, you know, properties, you know, physical properties meaning uh, melting points, specific heat and, and color, you know, all these things. Chemical properties change, electrical properties change, mechanical properties change, optical properties, magnetic properties, so on and so forth, okay? So you get the picture. I'll give you some examples, okay? Um, the first example is, uh, you know, metal particles melt at a temperature lower than the bulk metal, okay? So the example that I have here is gold. If you have a bar of gold and uh, a pure gold, and if you can afford to, you know, throw it in a furnace or an oven and watch it melt, and uh, so you will notice that actually it melts at 1064 degrees centigrade, right on the dot, okay? So that's what all the textbooks tell you, and they don't, textbooks don't lie, okay? So 1064 degrees centigrade, and it melts. On the other hand, you make uh, uh, nanoparticles of gold. You know, that actually I'm sure everybody can afford. <laughs> and uh, so throw them in the furnace and watch them melt. And you will notice something like a four nanometer particle melts approximately 200 degrees quicker or sooner than the bulk melting point. So the simplest, actually, uh, melting point, you know, is, is one of the simplest properties, okay? Even that changes when you go from big scale to nano scale, okay? So that's one example. I don't want to give you too many examples, just one more, okay? Again, I want to stick with gold, okay? I mean, I like to stick with things I can't afford, okay? And um, 
So what it is is, um, you know, gold we know the color is actually, you know, yellow. Uh, but even a couple of thousand years ago, the Chinese uh, uh, were the first one to make, you know, pottery. And they found that um, uh, you can add tiny particles of gold in the pottery making process and you end up making, uh, you know, ruby color waste. Okay, so, uh, so the color changes, the tiny particle of gold actually uh, the color is, you know, different. And um, so even simple thing like, you know, color changes. So these are a couple of examples. Uh, and there are, there are many, many more, but, you know, you get the picture. Okay. So then the question is, uh, somebody is going to ask, okay, uh, isn't this all chemistry? Okay. Well, let's see. And uh, uh, I mean, when we talk about atoms and molecules, they're generally smaller than the one nanometer. Remember, I said you need 10 hydrogen atoms right next to each other to make one nanometer. So a hydrogen atom is substantially smaller than and a single nanometer. Okay. So that's what we study in chemistry. On the other hand, when we go to physics, okay, so we study in physics solids with an, an infinite array of atoms, okay, and these atoms are bound to each other, okay, they're all pretty happy atoms, okay, and so that's what we study in condensed matter physics, okay. In the nanotechnology or nanoscience, you know, we talk about the, the, the in-between world, you know, which the scientists call the meso world, okay. And the nano systems, you know, I'm talking now about systems, they are not large enough to obey the classical law, you know, laws. Just to give an example, I'm sure you all heard about the so-called Ohm's law, okay. Ohm's law basically tells you that uh, if you were to take something like a copper wire or aluminum wire which conducts electricity, the current that goes through a wire is proportional to the, the voltage that you put in. Okay, and uh, the proportionality constant is what we call resistance. Okay, and the resistance of an aluminum wire is higher than copper. What that means is copper conducts electricity much more easily than aluminum. And likewise, actually, aluminum is better than uh, um, something like steel, so on and so forth. Okay, so when we talk about copper wires and aluminum wires, all these wires actually they follow the classical. Ohm's law. But in the nano uh, system, the system is not big enough for this classical law, you know, to apply. So these are all the differences. So the point I'm trying to make is it is in plain chemistry, okay? It's, it's something, you know, something different. But you still have to understand chemistry, okay? So when did it all start, okay? Well, actually, the use of nanomaterials, whether they knew it or not, it goes back even centuries. Okay? I, I talked about the Chinese pottery makers. Obviously, Chinese pottery makers you know, didn't have access to the FEA scanning electron microscope, and they had no idea you know, what the size of the particles were or what they were doing. You know, one of those days, I think, somebody in Shanghai or Beijing, I think they just probably had something, and maybe you know, it probably came out of a snuff box they had or whatever it just spilled onto the pottery. This thing it was an accidental discovery and probably got a ruby color base and then, you know, played around with it. So it was just empirical, okay. They didn't have that much of an understanding. And you could actually uh, give a lot of examples in the history that use, you know, tiny materials. Even actually things like photography uh, using silver particles in developing the film and uh, uh, all those things are actually uh, uh, examples, you know, originally developed empirically, okay. Um, but now, what it is, is in the modern days, actually, with all the instruments we have, we are trying to develop an understanding. The reason is, with understanding comes opportunities to improve things, okay. Uh, you know, that, that, that is the important contribution of science. Okay, so we re the scientists actually they want to explain everything in the universe. Okay, uh, otherwise you know I mean they they get totally restless and uh, um, because when you can explain when you understand then you can you can make things better. Okay, so that that's that's the reason. So the key modern dates. Okay, so we want to come come out of the the the, the pottery making process and come to the you know the modern days. 
uh, the very first time somebody uttered the phrase and, and talked about the potential of uh, nanotechnology was uh, 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 Richard Feynman. At, at, he was a professor at Caltech. In 1959, uh, you know, he gave a lecture which you know, became much fam more famous later on and it was titled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Okay, so he obviously meant you know, the, the small things, where he talked about opportunities to assemble things from atoms and molecules you know, upwards. And then came actually the, the, the scanning um, tunneling microscope. It was invented uh, by IBM uh, in their uh, lab in Zurich in, in Switzerland. Uh, and most recently, uh, President Clinton signed the uh, US uh, National Nanotechnology Initiative in, in 2000 and uh, you know, putting money into this uh, activity. Uh, that allowed uh, uh, resources you know, to flow into universities, so there could be all kinds of research uh, you know, looking into all aspects of you know, nanotechnology. So, so that's, those are some key modern you know, dates in the history of uh, nanotechnology. So the first material that I want to talk about is, is carbon nanotube. Uh, people have been talking about this for a number of years now, like uh, as if it is a um, you know, magical you know, material. In some in, in cases, you know, it, it, it certainly appears so. Okay? So certainly we all know about carbon. A okay? couple of forms of carbon, everyone familiar with, uh, obviously the first one is uh, you know, diamond, everyone knows. Graphite, okay, the graphite is the same thing that is in your pencil lead. Okay? So that's graphite. The carbon nanotube is another form of carbon. Okay, and uh, since the word tube appears, you know, that there is a reason because it's a tubular form of carbon. And the diameter can be as small as one nanometer, even slightly smaller. And the length actually could be up to now, you know, you know some people claim up to millimeters, okay. Um, I'm just asking you to do an imaginary ex you know, experiment. If you were to take just one layer of you know, graphite sheet, you know, the same graphite I talked about, you know, the one in your pencil lead. Just take one layer of graphite sheet, and if you were to roll it like you would roll a cigar, okay, so what you will get is a nanotube, okay. Um, obviously, nobody is, you know, sitting there uh, rolling cigars using, you know, you know graphite sheets. It's, it's just pretty much impossible. Uh, you, can, uh, you can grow them in the laboratory. In, in reactors, and there's quite a lot of work going on at PSU right here um, uh, in growing these carbon nanotubes in the lab, okay? Trust me, that's actually a lot faster, a lot cheaper than rolling cigars. And uh, um, so this is, this is how a nanotube looks like. Uh, this diameter is about one nanometer, uh, and this is an electron microscopy you know, image of a, uh, of a carbon nanotube. So a few other nanomaterials. I'm sorry, I want to talk for a moment some interesting properties of carbon nanotubes before I move on to the other materials. Okay, the first one is, uh, it's an extraordinarily strong material. Okay. Just to give some comparison, it's 100 times stronger than steel, but approximately weighs only one-sixth. Okay. The second one is, you know, carbon nanotube can be metallic, you know, it could be like a metal, it could be like copper. On the other hand, it could be like in a uh, semiconducting too, you know, just like the silicon you have in the silicon in a computer chip. So that's very unique. You know, it can it can play either role. Okay. The third one, you remember I mentioned that actually the small materials have a large surface area, and that is absolutely true of the carbon nanotube. You take only four grams of carbon nanotubes, it has the same area as one football field. I mean, that's a mind-boggling, okay, um, uh, uh, number, okay. Just four grams of carbon nanotubes have, the, has the same area as one football field, okay. So that's, that's just uh, remarkable. It has very high electrical conductivity, you know, much higher than copper, and it has very high thermal conductivity. It can also conduct heat actually better than many metals, okay. So these are all some very, very interesting properties of carbon nanotubes. So now moving along, actually, a couple of other nanomaterials, okay. So the first one is, you know, nanowire, 
Okay. You take a look at uh, the periodic table, you will find a lot of inorganic uh, materials like silicon, germanium and, uh, and compounds like gallium arsenide and gallium nitride. I mean you can put together all kinds of combinations you know, from your periodic table. Uh, under certain rules, I mean, not you know, not every permutation combination is possible, okay? and uh, the community has been growing them in thin films and bulk materials uh, for 50, 60, 70 years. But in the last five to uh, six years, uh, the same materials now you can grow them like nano wires. So what you see here are, can you see them? What you see here are these are nano wires, okay. nanoparticles and nanopowders, okay, so any number of nanoparticles and nanopowders. And then there is another material which is actually very interesting, it's called in you know, a dendrimer, okay. And a dendrimer is like a polymer, um, it's, 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 a, it's a polymer and in uh, you know, a polymer, you know, which is one of the main component of the plastic, okay, generally they are made uh, like films and fibers and so on and so forth. A dendrimer is a special kind of polymer, you know, it's more like, like a tree-like polymer because it's got all these kind of interesting branches, okay. But in addition to the interesting branches, okay, it also has a cavity in the middle, okay. So you can stuff this cavity with something, you can stuff this cavity with the drug, okay, so you can do drug delivery. Okay. Or you can stuff this cavity with a catalyst and you can use it in uh, petroleum refining or something. Okay. So, uh, so this is an interesting uh, nanomaterial, a dendrimer. So these are all some, um, and I just want to give you some idea of, um, of, of nanomaterials. Okay. So what is the impact of nanotechnology? Okay. The impact of nanotechnology, you know, because the properties uh, change, all kinds of properties change, physical, chemical, electrical, magnetic, optical, so you can expect the impact is going to be right across the board, okay. Electronics, computing, communication, materials, manufacturing, health, medicine, transportation, energy, environment, national security, space exploration, I mean I haven't left anything out, okay. And, um, so what that means is then nanotechnology is not any one technology, okay. So either you have to use a plural nanotechnologies, but I prefer to do it in a differently. Uh, it is actually an enabling technology, okay. I'll come back and amplify the word uh, enabling in a little later, okay. So right now let's leave it at that. So actually since uh, since I mentioned, you know, so many of these things, what I would like to do is in each of these areas, I just want to give a couple of examples and I still want to maintain the time so you can all go home at a decent time, okay. And so first thing is uh, computers, okay. I just want to talk briefly about evolution of computers, okay. If we go back about 15 years ago, the story of computing was shared computing, okay. Basically what it was called was a, a Cray computer. It was a company in Minnesota or the IBM mainframe computer. Tens of thousands of people in an office or across the country, they were sharing the computer. They were called mainframe computer. So uh, then came uh, the era, you know, which is what we have right now, is the so-called PC era, which is the personal computing. But in the future, actually, it is going to be what we call UC era, which is the ubiquitous computing. So in the ubiquitous computing era, what it is is thousands of computer chips, or, you know, if, if computers or computer chips, they're going to be sharing each and every one of us, okay. Essentially, the computer chips could be embedded in a wall and it could be embedded in, in chairs and clothing and light switches, maybe even your belt buckles, you know, so that way. You, know, you are actually, you know, walking down on Broadway on a nice uh, day, actually. The, the, uh, the computer chip on your belt buckle actually could be interacting with the, uh, the computer chip on the, on the um, store advertisement of a, uh, in a Chinese restaurant and then uh, dinner reservation, 6.30, you know, three people, no smoking, etc., etc. okay. So, uh, and it's essentially what we are talking about is, you know, connecting, you know, the world, uh, and, you know, all the things in the world, you know, with the, with the, with the world of, you know, in a computation. So that, that's, that's where we could be going, okay. So the past and present and, you know, future. Okay? So where does nanotechnology fit into this one? Nanotechnology in computing, okay. Uh, much faster computers with more efficient energy use, okay. The computers, as you know, are getting faster and faster, okay. 
One of the problems that the computer industry is facing, actually this cartoon came from, from Intel. Okay. One of the things that the computer industry is facing is the chips as they operate faster and faster, they're also putting out more and more heat. Okay. Just to give an idea, and uh, what they, the uh, Intel engineers plotted here is the so-called power dissipation in watts per centimeter squared. And uh, so this is actually generation of Intel chips. And I, I'm willing to bet most of these you know, chips in the, in, the, in the 70s and early 80s, I don't think any of us remember anymore. Okay? I'm sure at least some of you uh, would remember the 284 and, uh, I mean, and 386 and so on and so forth. Obviously, everyone will remember Pentium and, and then beyond. So what it is, is this curve shows that by the time we reach you know, 2010, the power dissipation could be you know, close to uh, 1,000 watts per centimeter square. But the Intel engineers, I mean, whoever said engineers don't have a sense of humor, actually they are wrong. Okay, so look at what the Intel engineers plotted here. Along with the curve, actually, they, this is a hot plate, you know, which uh, uh, you may see in the student arms, you know, to, to cook things. And this is a, um, a nuclear reactor, and this is a uh, rocket nozzle. Obviously, there is a sense in a surface. So the 1,000 watts per centimeter squared, which we anticipate by 2010, you know, that is comparable to a rocket nozzle or a nuclear reactor, okay? So imagine a scenario. If the engineers fail to dissipate this heat fast enough when the computer is working, you know, one of the two things can happen, okay? Let me first give you the best case scenario. The best case scenario is actually you turn on your computer, you start checking your email, you can also boil water you know, for your tea. Okay. <laughs> the worst case scenario is you turn on your computer, the circuit will vaporize by itself. Okay. And so what actually in nanotechnology people are trying to do is to accomplish the thing. Yeah. Let's go fast, okay, faster computers, but let's see what we can do, you know, to be more efficient energy use, okay? So that's so much on that. The next one is, historically, actually, the computer is somebody makes a logic chip, you know, the computer chip. Somebody makes a memory chip, okay? And nobody does uh, anything to do with, you know, sensing and so on and so forth, okay? And uh, it's possible in the future the same chip can have logic, memory, and sensing. So where do you think the inspiration come from? It's our own head, okay? We can actually, we have logic, and we have memory, and we have a bunch of sensors, okay? So inspired by that, potentially we can have the same chip holding logic, memory, and sensing. So these are some of the advan advances we can expect in the computing era, okay? And the electronics, in the electronics, uh, higher density data storage, you know, CDs and DVDs, you know, which can store uh, much, much higher amount of data and music and video, so on and so forth, still shrinking the size, okay? Uh, and then uh, uh, companies are now already working on this, especially the Japanese companies, Samsung, you know, they're all working on this one. Intelligent appliances, you know, that can integrate sensing and all the advances we have already made in communications and network and electronics, okay? Uh, I just don't ask me why. I have no idea why I would need an intelligent refrigerator. Okay, and uh, but let me tell you how it works. And um, what they are talking about is what they are talking about is. And um, you know, I just want to keep it light because it's getting late in the day, right? And what they are talking about is um, uh, you, you have a milk carton, and uh, you know, milk is pretty low. And uh, so there is a sensor that could tell actually the depth is, you know, so low, it's time to order, okay? Or sometimes actually, you know, the milk uh, level may not be uh, low, it may be pretty much three quarter full, but it's been, you know, sitting there for two weeks and it's just basically stinking up the refrigerator. Okay, so that needs a different sensor. In, in one case, it's a level sensor. In the other case, it's a order sensor, okay? So you need two different types of sensors. The same thing goes for, you know, uh, an egg, Carton, okay, so one can count the number of eggs, the other can actually smell, you know, the, the rotten egg, okay. So what it is, is, you know, so the bottleneck right now is actually, is to come up with tiny sensors which don't interfere with the operation of the refrigerator, and which also don't take up too, you know, too much power, okay. And uh, so then combine that sensor uh, uh, with the communication network and the electronics and all of those things, uh, bingo, then you can send actually a, 
uh, in a quick signal to, to your to local Safeway or whatever your favorite grocery store is, and then things get delivered. Okay, but uh, um, so so these are some of the uh, the the things that you can expect in 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 electronics. So moving right along, uh, the next one is um, you know health and medicine. Okay, I'm sure you all you know heard about the. Um, or know about the, uh, the, the human genome sequencing. You know, it, was, it was done very successfully and uh, the human genome sequence is known and uh, all of that wonderful stuff. Uh, but what it is, is, the pervasive impact of that is, is, is we haven't started feeling it yet. And uh, one of the things that is happening right now is actually uh, a number of groups across the country are doing research you know, to accelerate this uh, gene sequencing process. Uh, for example, if it can be done in about an hour or two, okay, uh, you know, perhaps I, I just want to keep moving along, uh, but perhaps under Q and A or something, if I get an opportunity, I can explain, you know, how this one works. But for the time being, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving. And uh, so the idea is actually, you know, right now, you know, therapeutics is based on statistics. Okay. So what it is, is uh, you, know, you, you get sick, when you go to the doctor and the doctor looks at the symptoms, he or she has seen that symptoms in thousands of people, so they guess, oh, that's what you got. Okay. So that's based on st statistics. And, um, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, the prescription, um, uh, no, for, what did I say? I said therapeutics, not diagnostics is based on, you know, statistics. And the therapeutics also is based on, you know, uh, statistics. What it is is, ah, they've given this pill to thousands of people, it kind of worked in at least most of them, and, you know, and then it probably would work for you too, okay? And, uh, but remember actually all those commercials that you see, actually they say very fast on TV all the side effects you have, which you actually, sometimes you wonder you would rather have the original thing than all these side effects. And, uh, so that's basically because we are all different, okay? I mean, even among a homogeneous population in a place like Maine and New Hampshire, people are still different, okay? <laughs> and then, and then you, you, come to, you come to Bay Area, and we have about 150, you know, different this thing, and the statistics, if it is gathered from there, I mean, what good is that statistics? So now, that, now you know why those fast talkers are, you know, making money and doing those commercials. So the idea here is if the entire, a human, uh, I mean, the genetic makeup can be sequenced in about an hour or two. What that means is, you know, you just go there once and then you give a DNA sample, just, you know, go have a cup of coffee, come back, and, and then, you know, your genetic makeup is known and it could be just coded on a plastic card and you can just carry it in your wallet. And then from then onwards, actually, it could be individualized medicine. Okay, so that's a possibility. Okay, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to say. I mean, the, in each of those areas, by the way, I can give you 10, 15, 20 examples, but then, you know, we, we, we won't get home on, you know, at a decent time. And uh, so I just pick up a couple of them. Okay, so the second example I want to give is, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, whether it's a football player who got his knee banged up or, or an unfortunate soldier coming back from Iraq, and, uh, you know, quite a lot of them are coming back. Uh, with, you know, with uh, lost knees and lost limbs and, and, uh, and uh, all kinds of things. So, you know, they are, uh, you need to stitch them up with artificial body parts. You know, it could be a ligament, it could be a limb, or it could be a leg or whatever. And um, the problem is actually the body tends to reject these parts, artificial parts, in a couple of years. Then they got to go back and get opened up and stitched up with new stuff and come back. It's excruciating. So what it is is... Um, uh, there is a lot of effort going on, um, you know, to develop more durable, you know, rejection-proof um, artificial body parts. In fact, um, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the um, uh, uh, things that um, uh, material scientists and, and, uh, and uh, mechanical engineers and uh, uh, the medical community working together. And then targeted drug delivery. Okay. So right now, actually, if, you know, whether it is a tumor or, or whatever, in many of those cases, actually, drug is delivered, but, you know, do we know, you know, whether it gets to where it's supposed to? Okay. So targeted drug delivery, you know, it's just like the, uh, you know, the UPS guy, basically, with the barcode and everything, he drops the package exactly on the doorstep, okay, and uh, rather than putting it in every house on the way. And uh, it's the same thing. It's just delivering the drug exactly where it is needed, okay? So these are some examples on health and medicine. And then the next one is on manufacturing, okay? 
So uh, in manufacturing in materials, let's say that uh, you want to get a final shape of a material. What do we normally do? We take a bulk material and we started actually slicing it and, and dicing it uh, to get the final shape. On the other hand, under nanotechnology, what we are looking to do is to, is to you know, get the final shape just by you know, starting from the bottom okay, and assemble your way you know, to the final shape. Why would you want to do that? What it is is you know, hopefully that you can minimize waste. Okay? Instead of slicing and dicing, you know, if you start from assembly, you use precisely what you need and minimize waste. Potentially, it could be lighter, stronger material, and you can also probably program the properties, okay? so-called in you know, a designer material. So that, that's a possibility. And uh, you know, self-healing material. Okay? What is a self-healing material? Okay? Where does the inspiration come from? Hey, you have a paper cut. You don't do much. Basically, just leave it there. It bleeds for a minute or two, and then you know the skin. You know, uh, heals by itself. It's the same thing. Okay, so so you have a, what happens is in a, in any material. Okay, with the, uh, the, the the crack starts a very uh, minute crack. <clears throat> okay, what they call a hairline crack. If you don't notice it, you keep on putting more and more load on it. That small crack becomes a bigger crack, and then you put more load on it, it becomes a bigger crack. Eventually, there is a catastrophic failure. Okay? But can we have a self-healing material where actually when there is a minute crack, it's just like the blood flows immediately through capillaries to the, you know, to the, uh, the area where it got cut. Uh, there could be a sealant you know, could be flowing uh, 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 you know, to the place where the crack occurred, and then that sealant probably in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, basically could, you know, close that uh, uh, crack. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a possibility, okay, self-healing material. In a lot of cases, actually, you know, we are looking to nature, okay, you know, for inspiration, uh, the so-called, you know, biologically inspired material, okay. And uh, one example that I want to give is a synthetic, you know, gecko feed. Um, so a gecko, okay, so the gecko basically climbs on wall and, you know, uh, and then walks upside down on, on, uh, on the roof. Um, a few years ago, a scientist um, imaged the bottom uh, side of the gecko feet. Okay, so this is what it looks like. It has got two sets of hair, okay. Uh, the, the first set, which is the innermost part, is the... Um, it's fairly thick hair, it's kind of, you know, micron size. But the outer part, you know, which grabs onto the surface, it's actually a nanoscale hair, okay. Ironically, that nanoscale hair, you know, looks pretty similar to the nanotubes, carbon nanotubes that we grow, okay. So in our lab and UC Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon and quite a few places, uh, we have been playing around with actually the uh, carbon nanotube and then we try to mimic the gecko feed. For years, actually, people used to think that the gecko have some kind of a chemical uh, adhesive, okay, so that's why they can just stick to the uh, ceiling upside down, and then every time when they move their feet, they just peel off like Velcro. No, that's absolutely not true. It's a physical force, okay. So when you have size that's small, it's a physical force, and there is a name for it. It's called Van der Waals force, you know, named after a Dutch, you know, scientist. And so we were able to reproduce that uh, Van der Waals force uh, at the same level, actually even better than a gecko, um, uh, using carbon nanotubes. And then we created, you know, what we call the synthetic gecko feed. And this work was done in uh, our lab in collaboration with UC Berkeley. And uh, the UC Berkeley mascot is, is a bear, okay. So what uh, the graduate student did was, uh, he took actually about one millimeter, one square millimeter of a carbon nanotube, uh, sample and then um, he was able to hang uh, the uh, in a UC Berkeley mascot okay uh, up, uh, upside down from the ceiling okay so if you were to scale that up what that tells you is uh, a, a human being which is about 175 pounds should be able to hang from the ceiling just using the palm okay and uh, so we have been able to do that, so that's better than gecko. So where we haven't achieved what gecko can do is, a gecko, I, I, I don't know how long a gecko you know, lives, but during its lifetime, I'm sure it walks you know, miles, which means, uh, I don't know, gazillion number of steps. Whereas our material you know, failed probably after about 100 times um, you know, adhesion and then taking it out and, you know, peeling and uh, after 100 times. So, but again, actually, you know, gecko had, what, a million years to perfect and we, you know, we did this for 
I don't know, about six, seven months. So, and, uh, 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 so what I'm saying is things take time. Okay, so just, we just got to be patient, okay? And then there's a German group actually ha has developed um, a self-cleaning surface, self-cleaning uh, glass, okay? Lotus is a flower, which probably people in North America may not be familiar with because it's more, mostly an Asian flower, uh, countries like India and Indonesia. But this, uh, this lotus flower has a remarkable property. It has a way of keeping its surface very, very clean. And um, so uh, the German scientists have been able to actually uh, you know, reproduce that effect on, on glass, okay? So that actually would be good for car windshield, okay? So these are all some other things that we can anticipate on manufacturing. So just keep moving, actually. I just want to talk a little bit about fine particle technology, okay? Uh, common powders, these are not necessarily nano powders, okay? And um, uh, some of them are pretty big, like cement, fertilizer, and a face powder, table salt, sugar. You know, these are all something basically pretty big. So uh, these are not nanoscale at all, and they've been around for a long time. But there are powders which you don't even realize that they are there, okay? So that is actually in paint, toothpaste, lipstick, mascara, you know, chewing gum, and uh, mm, the slick magazine covers, you know, your Cosmopolitan or whatever, all those magazine covers, they all have uh, particles. You don't even know that they, are, they have nanoparticles of powders, okay? Floor coverings, automobile tires, okay? You think automobile tire is all rubber, okay? What it is, they use um, uh, nanosilicate particles and what the nanosilicate particle is. So rubber is like a string and uh, it could potentially unravel prematurely. What the nanosilicate particle does is it just sticks to the end of the string and then it prevents it from unraveling, okay? So, so these are all things. But what it is is when you talk about nanoparticle actually, there is always an optimum size, okay? The classic example of optimum size of a particle is peanut butter. Okay, we have two kinds, one is the crunchy one and the other is the creamy one. It's the same peanut, same everything, size is different, okay. And the creamy one, much, much smaller particle. And um, um, the other thing that you probably don't know and that you should check it when you go home is that uh, the ketchup has got uh, uh, fine amorphous silica, okay. And um, basically what the amorphous silica does is it controls uh, the flow of ketchup, okay? So you know who that, you know, um, so if you have to turn it around, constantly do that, that means they haven't done a good job. So that's all there is. And, uh, and then there are time-release vitamins, okay? A time-release medicine. So the way it is, it's like a capsule, and the, the vitamin is in, in a bunch of different particle size, okay? And the smaller size dissolves in your stomach acid first, and the bigger one dissolves later. It's a simple thing. So that's why, you know, the, you know some, 6% efficiency. And then the fluorescent lamps are somewhat better. But on the other hand, that there is something called solid state lighting and it is coming, it has come in big applications like uh, your traffic lights or, or some of the things that you see on the dashboard. But the price is not low enough for us to actually to replace all these filament bulbs in, a, in, a, in our house. Okay, so that's, that's um, you know, one example I can give. In the, in the energy area. The other thing is now you go to uh, you know, oil wells, actually what comes out of the oil well is, is crude oil. And then it needs to be shipped in a tanker or, 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 uh, or whatever, and then you go to a refinery and then you refine it to get petrol or what we call you know, gasoline. Uh, but is it possible for us to pump gasoline out of the well? Which means all the refining action should go on you know, uh, down there. So basically what it is, is it's a refinery in a hole. Okay, so these are a couple of examples. And let me see what else I have. And, and national security. Well, this is an, an interesting because the Department of Defense is one of the biggest sponsors of uh, nanotechnology. Um, so a, a tank actually is about 80 tons. Okay, so when you have to ship 1,000 tanks uh, across halfway around the world to Iraq and Afghanistan, Wow, you know, the logistics is a nightmare, okay? I mean, we, if we are spending $400 billion on defense and you know, you know, logistics actually you know, it takes a good chunk of it. Also, we complain about our SUVs, you know, in terms of miles per gallon, but where, whereas um, these tanks actually, the metric is the reverse, it's gallons per mile. Okay. So what it is, is uh, if, if the 80-ton 80, uh, 80 tank, you know, could be reduced to 30-ton tank, okay? 
but without losing a single functionality. That's an important thing. Okay, so I, we don't want to do any sacrifices. Exactly identical performance, but if you can reduce the weight, okay, by by making better composites and then better materials and then shrinking, uh, you know, some of the communication and other things that they have. So that actually would save us a lot of money on logistics and gasoline and so on and so forth. It, the same thing applies to the to the the soldier too. An average so a backpack is about 60, 70 pounds, and trust me, it's not food cans or anything. It's all, all kinds of gear, communication gear, batteries, and so on and so forth. And um, so if that can be reduced to you know, 30 pounds, you know, that actually makes it easier for a soldier. In fact, the Army has an institute called Institute for Soldier Nanotechnology, which is at uh, MIT and which is very well funded and they've been do doing a lot of you know, wonderful things. And also an early warning sensor for chem, bio and nuclear threats. Okay? So these are all the things that... Um, so I've given you a couple of examples in each of the sectors. Okay? So now the next thing is, um, when is it all going to happen? Okay. Um, one of the things that I like to tell people, the society's behavior is absolutely no different from the teenagers. Okay. And um, what it is, is you, know, you, you put a few, couple of kids on the back seat of an SUV and start on a long road trip from Bay Area to, to Grand Canyon. Every hour on the hour, mom, are we there yet? Okay. And it's pretty much the same thing, actually, you know, with society at large. A, we started giving money to you starting 2000 when President Clinton signed this wonderful nanotechnology initiative, and since then we've been putting money every year. And when President Bush came on, you know, he also endorsed it, and he started giving you even more money than, you know, President Clinton. What have you got? Okay. So in that sense, actually, I just want to go back and look at history, and this is something actually. You know, Terry, would, uh, Terry Bristol would like because you know, he specialized in history of science and engineering. Okay? So if you look at you know, history, and there have been a lot of you know, similar things that happened uh, in, the, in the history before, you know, textiles and railroad and automobile and, and, um, and um, uh, aircraft and, and you know, computers. If you take a look at actually um, something like an automobile, you know, un unless you are you know, uh, you know, hot rod guy or, or GM, and you know, for you it's all about internal combustion engine and, and if it is a railroad, if it is a train, it's all about steam engine or, or whatever. And, but it's not all about steam engines and internal combustion engine. But what the airlines and, and automobiles and railroads before them, what they did was they brought people together, which means it, it promoted uh, commerce. Okay. And it also actually allowed you know, different cultures to learn things from each other. And it's all about commerce and then it, it just enabled you know, things. And um, likewise, actually, computer technology, you know, it's not just about silicon, it's not just about Moore's law. I mean, the guys who work at Intel, you know, they make a living, so they actually live and die by the, uh, and the MIPS and FLIPS and whatever they call it, okay? But what it is, is for the society at large, you know, it basically touch as, you know, most aspects of our life, okay? So these are all enabling technologies. So nanotechnology, by virtue of all the things that I was talking about, it is similar to those, you know, it's an enabling technology and if you look at these curves actually all these enabling technologies they take actually about 15 or 20 years actually to put some roots you know 15 or 20 years actually to put some roots and then the next 50 years you know you basically it just keeps on um, you know the, the area keeps on growing that then comes a point basically you know it just becomes something like a commodity or routine thing I mean uh, in a railroad, it's, it's pretty routine. And um, so that is, that's what it is. So in that sense, actually, we are way early in the game, okay? So the, uh, the, the important thing is we just got to be patient, okay? And so now, now let me talk about the opportunities, and I'm going to wrap up in about five minutes. Right now, actually, a lot of you know, cosmetics and uh, some of the cosmetic companies like L'Oreal, they have more nanotechnology patents than probably you know, some of the big electronic companies. And uh, you know, nanoparticle in inkjet printers and all kinds of sports goods and uh, you know, stain-resistant clothing you, know, uh, you can get from Eddie Bauer. And uh, you know, the automotive industry already uses actually nanoparticles and engine covers and body moldings. You know, there, there are all kinds of things. In fact, there are a lot of websites you know, who, who you can check out to see you know, where it's all being used right now. 
And um, so the near-term opportunities, I'm talking about you know, three to seven years. I mentioned about the solid-state lighting, um, you know, batteries, you know, better batteries, you know, which last longer. Fuel cells, you know, flat panel displays, you know, that will replace the LCD and plasma displays, you know, biosensors, better drug delivery that I, w I was talking about, memory devices, nanomaterials, coatings, you know, these are all the things. The real long-term ones are, I'm talking about something beyond, you know, 15 years. The personalized medicine that I was talking about, you know, lightweight composites in automobiles and aircraft, okay, so, uh, this, but that's because actually those industries are risk covers. Okay, carbon nanotube is wonderful just because I said so or just because, you know, people at PSU said so. Uh, as wonderful as they are, you know, if they are used in aircraft, even I wouldn't actually take that flight to go home. And because it, it, it just, you know, it needs a lot of testing. And um, uh, what it is, is uh, like I was telling uh, earlier to the students uh, in the high school, uh, the, the, the aircraft we always you know, thought of as a big aluminum tube. Uh, but when Boeing introduced a 777, uh, they used 10% composites using uh, you know, some kind of you know, fibers, polymer fi um, fibers and polymers, carbon fibers and polymers. But now the 787 Dreamliner, which is coming uh, in the next couple of years, that's going to be 50% composites. Again, it uses the predecessor of carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube, as the name implies, is a nano, but the bigger carbon fiber, which is a micro and macro, like hundreds of micron fiber, and that's a 20, 25-year-old technology. And that is being used uh, as a composite, you know, which is actually the supplier is a big Japanese company, Torre, and they supply it to, uh, to Boeing. And so 50% of the, uh, the aircraft now is going to be composite. So what it is, is um, uh, for, uh, you know, for the same strength and for the same safety and everything, a composite is much lighter. Much lighter translate into much better you know, fuel savings, which is very important for, for uh, for the airlines. For you and me, what is more important is, is the, the, the comfort, okay? Basically, when you're flying at 36,000 feet, what it is is that the air that is in there feels like it is about 8,000 feet, okay? 8,000 feet is like pretty much a little higher than Aspen, Colorado, and it's not that comfortable. Uh, some people have breathing problems and there is not enough moisture, so you just get out actually whistling, your nose is whistling because it's so dry. And um, so those are all the problems. The reason is actually the metal, uh, uh, if you compress it too much to keep it at the same level as this room, uh, the metal will have fatigue. Okay, that's one problem. And then if you increase the humidity to make it, you know, comfortable, then actually uh, over a period of time, you know, they use these planes for 25 years, but actually it will cut down to 15 years because metals rust. Okay, so that's a problem. So now imagine when 50% of the, you know, plane is going to be composite, what it is is these composites actually don't rust, so they can pump in a little more humidity, so you know, we will be more comfortable. And also, they don't have the fatigue level as the same uh, metal, so that means actually they don't have to keep it at like the 8,000 feet pressure, they can drop it down to 3,000 feet or so. That will be that much more comfortable, okay? Uh, but what the point I'm trying to make was, these fibers were developed about 20, 25 years ago. It took them this long to put it in the plane because not only actually they had to make the large quantities and, and affordable price, so on and so forth. Above all, they have to test them and test them and test them and test them and certify them because people are going to be, you know, playing on them and it's a risk averse industry. So that's, that's going to take a while. And then the silicon computers, you know, beyond silicon, what is there next? Okay, so these are all things, you know, which are going to take 15 or 20 years. But one of the things I always want to tell people is when we talk about anything beyond 15 or 20 years, we have no clue what it could be, okay? And uh, it is something that we haven't even thought about, okay? I, just to give you a very quick example, uh, there was a gentleman by name Herb Cromer, okay, who was an immigrant from... from um, uh, Germany, I think in the 50s, and uh, he went to the Bell Labs uh, in the 50s. Uh, in the Bell Labs at that time, everybody was working on silicon because that was the silicon, uh, you know, replacing the vacuum diode with the, with the transistor. And this man was working on something called gallium arsenide, and people were thinking, hey, what is this guy, German guy doing? You know, something totally strange. And uh, so after a few years of actually all of that, he was fed up and he decided to, you know, bolt New Jersey and went to California. And he joined University of California, Santa Barbara, and he continued the research. Even there, actually, some of the faculty members, they didn't quite understand what he was doing, why he was doing all of that. 
But what it is is um, uh, the gallium arsenide material. You know, first they, you, in the first thing they made was laser. Okay, and the first um, mass use of laser was the supermarket scanners. Okay, and that was I, I believe I wasn't in this country at the time. Maybe in the 70s, and uh, then came the CD players. Then came the DVD players. Okay, now you tell me. In the 50s and 60s, who ever thought of actually CDs and you know, DVD players? They had no idea. Nobody, and not even science fiction probably, you know, talked about uh, you know, CDs and DVDs uh, in, in, the, in the 60s. But what it is, is you know, the, the, to make the story short, actually he went on to get the Nobel Prize about four or five years ago in physics. So when we talk about all these things long term, you know, a lot of the things that we haven't even thought of. Okay? So that is something that you want to keep in mind. And uh, um, so, what do we need to do? Okay. Well, uh, the federal government should continue with research funding. Okay. So that, as far as I'm concerned, goes without saying. And um, we also have to, you know, right now there's a lot of it is basic research, but it's about time to start thinking, you know, beyond the basic research. You know, trying to convert the science into engineering and technology. Uh, and start focusing on products, okay? Because remember, there is from the moment that you start you know, shaking and take, you know, baking things in the lab, and then the time you see products on the main street or market street, you know, there is a large gap. It usually takes about ten years, you know, because you have to convert the science into a product, and then you got to check the robustness, you got to check the ruggedness, you got to check quality control, and then you got, you know, the, the, the ultimate question, am I going to be able to make this at a price that somebody is willing to buy, okay? All these things take time, and uh, so the gap between science, early science, and the product, it's a horrendous, huge gap, and it takes a lot of effort to bridge the gap, and so we got to get started on that, and uh, absolutely, I mean, I'm not saying this just because I'm an engineer, and uh, you know, the engineers are responsible to make the product, so we got to get them involved. And, um, and then in many cases, actually, what it is is, you know, individually institutions, you know, starve for facilities. You know, so we have to have things like Onami, okay? What it is is so common use facilities, you know, bringing people. So this cartoon is, is just about that, okay? So this is, this is what you see in your National Geographic special, okay? Right in the middle of Africa, a dry summer. There is a tiny, actually, water hole. Even all those animals which don't even like the sight of each other, they all get together and then they just, you know, share the same water whole. It's pretty much the same thing, but I think we can do better than that. We get along with each other, I think. And common facilities and collaboration. Okay. And then, you know, investment, obviously venture capital, big companies, all of those things. And uh, as a nation that we really have to, you know, work very hard to create and capture market. Uh, and absolutely we have to focus on the, you know, safety and public health uh, because if people, if, if, for, for, for the most part, you know, when you, you know, venture into some unknown areas, you know, you just got to be cautious and uh, you really have to pay attention to, you know, the safety issues. And you also got to be upfront with the public and you got to educate them, you know, rather than saying, hey, trust us, you know, we know what we are doing. You know, that's the time you start running very fast on the other direction, okay? So, so it is very important to be honest and upfront and uh, ed educate the people. So that brings me to the, you know, to the last view graph that I have. And... Um, so a couple of things that I just want to uh, you know, take home uh, with, want you to take home with this is nanotechnology will be the technology of the 21st century, okay? And uh, so that's, that's, that's very important. It's an enabling technology and it's going to be a technology of the 21st century. It's a very broad and enabling technology base, okay? And uh, so in that sense, it will actually uh, impact across the entire economic spectrum, okay? And this fact has been recognized not just in the U.S., okay? It is true that we, we started the National Nanotechnology Initiative and President Clinton was the very first one to sign it. But since then, pretty much all the industrialized nations have replicated that. So it is recognized you know, globally you know, across the world. And uh, absolutely, there, there is a race on, okay? So what it is is we, we have to get ready. And the single most important thing that in, in, to me and in my mind, and I want all of you actually you know, to think about it, and I'm sure you will agree, is that we have to take, you know, we have an obligation to educate the future you know, generation scientists and engineers in this country about this new emerging field. So with that, I think, I'm, you know, I think it's the right time for me to quit, and, uh, and I will be happy to answer um, a few questions, okay?
Yeah, go ahead. I sort of had an aha during your presentation here that uh, actually since the uh, late 50s and 60s, the biological field has really been focusing more on nanotechnology. They've uh, been going into the su uh, suborganelle and looking at how the life processes happen that way. I was wondering, um, uh, and then the enzyme systems are very specific for uh, making uh, shaped uh, proteins and particles. Uh, is this approach being used at all in ne nanotechnology? Or the biology seems like a good way to tie things together. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, there is one branch of, uh, in a nanotechnology which, uh, which is recently gaining popularity is uh, the so-called bio-nano, where um, the, uh, the utilization of uh, uh, biological inspiration, uh, you know, to create new materials, that's one thing. And also u utilization of, uh, you know, bi uh, biological materials themselves, like for example, using enzymes or proteins, you know, to tag particles. And uh, so that field, the so-called bio-nano field, um, is, is, is gaining a lot of momentum at this point. So, uh, so you are on the right track. You are absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, if they want, they can turn the light on too so we can see. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, my sister is doing a project on nanotechnology for the first LEGO League tournament. Uh, nanotechnology for what? The first LEGO League tournament, uh -huh. as I think Skip mentioned. And uh, she was wondering how nanotechnology can be used to, do, uh, to solve or cure brain tumors or um, any type of tumors, actually. Uh, nanotechnology can be used for brain tumors. Huh? Brain, brain tumors. Yeah. Um, you mean in how to attack the brain tumors? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one of the thing that um, um, where nanotechnology is used, you know, to attack tumors is there. There is an area called actually gene therapy. Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with nanotechnology, and uh, that is something that has been going on. Uh, the medical community, the, the molecular biology community has been working on it for, for quite a while. And uh, in order to deliver uh, the right type of genes, you know, to, to the specific areas, uh, the material, the biological materials that they were using, you know, some of the proteins and other things, apparently they were, they were pretty toxic and uh, there were problems. And uh, one way that uh, how nanotechnology could be used was, remember the material that I talked about, dendrimer? Uh, in fact, there was uh, Professor James Baker, uh, who's an MD, PhD at the University of Michigan. He's one of the pioneers who worked on the uh, uh, dendrimers. What they do is, if, if you remember, uh, the dendrimer has got a cavity in the middle, and so that cavity can be used to store or trap uh, a, 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 the, the um, you know, the so-called tumor killer, or whatever you use, and you can use the, the dendrimer to deliver um, the drug, actually, you know, to, uh, to the uh, to t tumor. So that's, that's one example. And there are, you know, similar examples where um, uh, basically using, um, you know, laser targets. So these are a couple of ways that um, uh, nanotechnology can be used you know, for, for brain tumors and for any other tumors. And uh, the National Cancer Institute, uh, which is a branch of National Institute of Health, uh, they have created, I believe, five or six nanotechnology centers uh, for, for cancer diagnostics and, and therapeutics. So if you go to the National Cancer Institute website, uh, I'm sure you can get information on uh, the locations of those five or six institutes and uh, how they are all using nanotechnology uh, to, to uh, deal with uh, tumors and, and cancer and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and also, uh, you mentioned how uh, in the first few slides, quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, can you explain how that has to, uh, how that deals with nanotechnology? Is that with the properties? Yeah, uh, what it is is, um, uh, when you um, when you have a, a, a computer device which is fairly big, uh, the quantum mechanics uh, will not play a role because an electron you know can travel with certain velocity. 
okay, uh, for a given applied uh, electric field. But on the other hand, when a layer of silicon or any of these uh, material that you use in a computer chip, when it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, what happens is the quantum mechanics actually can play a role. And when the layer is so thin, electron can tunnel through that thin layer. And uh, uh, sometimes it is good, you know, it all depends on what you want to do with it. Sometimes this actually could be bad. One of the problems that is right now happening is in the silicon chips that Intel is making or other companies' competitors making, what it is is uh, the, the, the computer chip or the, or the CMOS device has got what they call a source, okay, and a uh, drain and a gate, okay. The source and a drain and a gate in, in, in the big world, it is very similar to actually uh, water flowing through a pipe, you know, with the valve, okay. So what we call source and the drain are the two ends of the water pipe and what we call the gate in the silicon CMOS chip uh, is the valve. So you use the valve to regulate the water flow from left to right. It's the same thing in, in a silicon CMOS chip. The electrons are flowing from source to drain, you know, from left to right, and that is controlled by the, uh, by the gate in the middle, okay? So that's the analogy that should give you an idea. What happens is under this gate, there is a material called silicon dioxide, which is an oxide of silicon. And um, so when you turn the computer off, you know, for the most part actually nothing is happening and you are not actually uh, uh, dissipating power. But what happens is now when the device gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the thickness of that silicon uh, uh, dioxide, which is the gate oxide, it is so small that the electron can leak through it or tunnel through. So that means what happens is even when you're not working and the, and the chip is completely shut off, you know, that they call a leakage current, okay? So the leakage current can drain uh, uh, the, the whole device and, and the power, okay? So that is an example where quantum mechanics uh, is effective when you get a nano scale, but in that case actually it is working against you, okay, because it, it's, it's something that is actually harming you, okay. What it is that there are cases where you can be very clever and take advantage of the quantum mechanics. So uh, quantum mechanics will become an important thing when you get to very small scale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, doctor. Uh, you mentioned before about the carbon nanotubes using being used in electronics. Mm -hmm. I wonder if those are more efficient than fiber optics or do they work in conjunction with each other? Uh, actually it is appropriate to compare a carbon nanotube. Um, uh, if you're talking about a computer chip then it is appropriate to talk about carbon nanotube comparison against silicon. Okay so I will take that first. Um, a carbon nanotube right now on paper actually has got a lot more interesting properties and performance than, uh, than silicon and some people have even um, done experiments to prove that but what it, where we are right now is actually people can make one device, a 10 device, a 100 device, okay. Uh, but silicon right now what it is is you know when they have a wafer, what they call a silicon wafer which is a 10 inch wafer, it's about the size of your dinner plate and that has got like you know, several um, million transistors. Uh, per wafer. So we have to reach that kind of a mass manufacturing and that is going to take quite a while, okay. So only time will tell whether we can get there, okay. So if we can get there, that will be great. So that is actually carbon nanotube versus silicon in a computer chip. When you talk about carbon nanotube versus something like, you know, fiber optic, I assume that you are talking about actually like an interconnect or, or like a cable which, you know, carries electricity, okay. So in that case actually it's even uh, more appropriate to compare carbon nanotube versus copper because copper actually is an electrical conductor and um, so in, in, a, in, in a computer chip, in a computer basically you have a lot of these, you know, chips but they are all wired with each other and that is actually done using copper. Um, we are getting to a point that where we put so much current that actually copper is not able to handle that current. And uh, carbon nanotube actually can potentially handle the current better than uh, copper. Again, 
it's it is uh, it's going to take a while before we can put that into manufacturing okay so the science of some of these things has already been proven and um, but it's going to take time you know to to see the product development uh, in, in the, uh, the in, remember the things that I talked about robustness quality control and the price you can afford so that those things are remaining uh, things that need to be done you spoke earlier about rapid genome coding yeah and you had a graphic of DNA passing through something called a nanopore yeah would you care to expand on that please no oh, good okay so uh, in the interest of time I just I skipped it now that I'm glad you asked for it so what it is this um, uh, that nanopore essentially, uh, you know, think of a membrane, okay? And in the membrane, there is this tiny pore which could be a couple of nanometers diameter, okay? So that membrane is sitting in the middle of a cell. And on the left side of a cell, you have one electrode, okay, which is grounded. The other right side of the cell, the, there is another electrode you connect it to the um, power supply, okay? You put a voltage. So now you have a uh, potential difference from left to right with the membrane in the middle, okay? And now you fill the cell with the a DNA in a buffer solution, okay? So before you turn the power supply on, that there is a background current. Why? Because the buffer solution is like an electrolyte and it has got ions and the ions conduct current, so there is always a background current. Okay. But the moment you turn the power supply on, now the DNA will start moving because the DNA conducts current. Okay. DNA can conduct. And uh, so the, when the DNA goes through this tiny pore, you know, two nanometer pore, okay, that situation is like you know, pig in a hole or pig in a poke. Okay. Essentially what happens is now the DNA is actually going through the pore, the ions cannot go through. It blocks the background current. So you had a background current like that. Now that the DNA is stuck in the uh, pore and it is going through, basically the background current is going to drop. Okay. So until this DNA finishes passing through that pore, the drop in the current is still going to be there. Okay. So what it is is now you can measure how much that current drops and how long that drop lasts. Okay? So now you have to correlate those things you know, to the, what they call the individual nucleotides, which is the, you know, the DNA has got the four things, the A and the C and the G and the T. So you have to correlate this you know, to that. Okay? So, that is, so right now, you know, people are able to you know, make measurement of this current, uh, but uh, there is a whole field called bioinformatics. Okay? That is about trying to make sense out of these current signals and then uh, and correlating that current signal you know, to the A and the C and the G and the T in the local, uh, the DNA that is, you know, that is going through. So that is actually in a nutshell how the technology works. Thank you. What else do we have? I can't see from here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to Portland, Doctor. It was a really nice, uh, wonderful lecture. And I, I, I'm really curious about uh, nanotechnology in terms of uh, power. And I've read some things about MIT where they're using nanotubes as um, capacitors. So we can use capacitors in, instead of using batteries for storing power. Yeah, can what you? it is is what they call is, um, see the batteries work electrochemically. Essentially the batteries store energy through chemical reaction, okay? A capacitor actually is not chem in a chemistry, a capacitor is simply, you know, storing electricity, okay? So uh, the carbon nanotubes appear to be what they call ultra capacitor or, or, or super capacitor. So uh, that is, um, uh, in many cases, actually, you know, it's not generating energy, it is storing energy. For example, um, uh, take a look at, you know, solar energy, okay? And uh, you, you get plenty of solar energy during the day, but you're not home to use it. All computers are off and all TVs are off and probably just the refrigerator running. You know, there is not that much usage at home, okay? So what, you, what are you doing? If you're connected to the grid, actually, your meter runs reverse and then your utility company will give you credit. But if you're not connected to the grid, what are you going to do, okay? So, uh, so energy storage is an important area. And um, uh, so 
actually the MIT research that you're talking about and there are a number of other groups who are working on it as well. Uh, and they are all looking at the possibility of using, um, you know, carbon nanotube as an ultra capacitor. Do we, do we have any idea approximately when we can see this technology uh, making it down to, um, to uh, everyday use? <laughs> no, I, I, I hate to do predictions. No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks for coming to Portland. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the difference between the manufacture of nanomaterials and other materials, maybe give a couple of examples. Um, the manufacturing process itself, you know, could be using, um, you know, traditional um, methods that were used on, on a larger scale uh, particles. Uh, but there are also actually, in some cases, you know, it could be different chemistry and it could be assembling, uh, you know, completely using, you know, chemistry from the bottom up. So in that sense, um, uh, the processing scheme could be different and it could be, it could be cheaper. And um, uh, only time will tell that, you know, how, how successful we are in, in, uh, in making a lot of these nanoparticles, you know, from bottom up in, in a cheaper way as opposed to uh, taking a very large uh, crystal and then start grinding it and grinding it and grinding it until we reach the nanopowder. And um, um, so, so th there are quite a lot of techniques that are being developed actually to, to, to make, you know, nanoparticles and the cost competitiveness and, um, uh, uh, and related issues are not, you know, not completely, uh, you know, figured out. Uh, and then, of course, the, the issue of, um, you know, safety too, because yeah, when you are making nanoparticles in, in open uh, technique, and then if you have to put it on a 50-gallon drums, and uh, um, so the workers who produce them and the workers who ship them and the workers who receive them, and uh, we have to figure out what happens if they inhale it. You know, some may be good and some may be bad. Uh, for example, um, I mean, I live in the Bay Area, and uh, uh, at least every couple of weeks, actually, the car, uh, I mean, not just the, the, the car body, but, uh, you know, the chrome wheels actually show totally black, uh, this thing, it all comes from emission. And if my car is attracting that much carbon emission, I'm sure there is so much of it in my nostrils and in my body, okay? But we probably, over a period of time, adapt, you know, have adapted to that, and, uh, but I'm not saying that you know, we will adapt to, you know, every type of nanoparticle, you know, some may be good and some may, I don't want to say anything could be good, but, you know, some may be, uh, you know, benign, but some may be the next asbestos, okay, so uh, we will know. Uh, one of the obligations that we have is uh, to put a decent percentage of our, our research dollars into, into the, into research, you know, looking into their safety aspects, you know, safety, uh, of the workers and, uh, you know, eventually safety of disposal and safety of the public and all of those things, so those things that, you know, we need to look at them, okay. So that, that may be not only unique to the, uh, to the uh, material, but also may be unique to the processing as well. We'll do just two more questions. We're not going to be able to take all these, so let's, would we just do one over, would we just do the last one there? Let's do one there and one there and yeah. then we've got to go. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, you talked about uh, actually you made a comparison between the UPS delivery guy and drug delivery within the body. Could you elaborate and uh, how, that's, how nanotechnology is going to help that? Um, again, just going back to the, the example of the dentimer that I, uh, I talked about, you know, that's like a big polymeric material with the cavity in the middle. And um, so uh, what it is is um, uh, you can fill the cavity with the... Um, uh, with, the, uh, with the drug and um, uh, so we can use that actually as, as a delivery mechanism uh, but to figure out exactly where to deliver uh, that would require actually a sensor also to be embedded in the same dendrimer so that sensor actually could locate uh, you know, the, the exact or precise place of the tumor and then uh, the drug delivery uh, could be activated at that moment. So that's a, in a line of thinking uh, that is being followed now um, in drug delivery. You know, that's just, just one, one so, simple example. Hi, doctor. Um, I would like to know how uh, carbon nanotubes are grown. Uh, 
repeat that again. How are the carbon nanotubes grown? How are the carbon nanotubes grown? Okay. Uh, I'm glad you asked because I specifically said um, yeah, it's not being rolled like cigars. And uh, what it is is um, uh, there is a reactor called in a chemical vapor deposition reactor. And uh, in fact, at some point in time when you get a chance and when they give tours at PSU, uh, you could do that. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a tubular reactor and um, uh, on the one end actually a gas uh, like methane, which is like your natural gas except a lot more pure, or something like acetylene, which is in your blowtorch, but again, a lot more pure. So one of those gases uh, mixed with hydrogen is coming at one end, and um, inside uh, what you have is on a, on a substrate, you know, it could be glass, it could be silicon, uh, it's like a holder, okay, and the holder, um, now uh, when it goes through, you know, you raise the temperature like to 700 or 800 degrees centigrade, but I'm sure your high school chemistry would tell you when you take some of those gases and raise the temperature, all you will get is amorphous carbon junk, okay. And how do you get carbon nanotubes? The trick is actually on the holder, you put tiny particles of a catalyst. This uh, catalyst particle is typically in, in a nickel or cobalt or, or, or iron, okay? So the trick is that those particles make the carbon nanotube grow instead of giving you junk, okay? And uh, so that's a quick uh, one minute explanation of how carbon nanotubes are grown in the lab. Thank you, and another question would be, um what field of engineering does nanotechnology fall under currently? Um, or for studying, actually, depending on your interest, you know, uh, if you're more into materials and um, you know, material science and uh, materials engineering, and if you want to use in, in uh, you know, refining, petroleum refining or, or chemicals and all of those things, you could study them in chemical engineering. But if you're interested in actually coming up with uh, uh, materials and new uh, high density CDs and DVDs and other electronic gadgets that I was talking about, electrical engineering. So in that sense, actually, it's uh, uh, a nano in many ways is an interdisciplinary field. And uh, so your basic degree could be in you know, physics or chemistry or any one of those engineering fields, and then you can pick up from there. And uh, what are the better schools? Oh. Uh -huh. Actually, the, the, the stain-resistant fabric, I don't think it's got to do with the uh, nanotube. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a company called Nanotex. It was based in the uh, Bay Area. And uh, um, again, you know, these are some of these things, you know, these guys don't publish because it you know, came from companies, so you really don't uh, have a clue, a whole lot of ideas, um, you know, what exactly was. It, this was some kind of a coding, you know, nanoparticle-based coding which went on the carbon fiber, uh, which makes it, you know, somewhat like a hydrophobic uh, situation, where if you um, drop um, in a red wine or whatever, it essentially, uh, you know, washes off. So that's that's a line of, um, you know, thinking on it, because you know, it, these are, you know, these are things that came from companies, so th there are not a whole lot of you know, details uh, on how. The other, in some of the other areas, uh, also again, again, it was kind of difficult to get, um, you know, information. Um, I think this was earlier in the year in Japan. Um, um, I was in Japan and I was flying back from Nagoya and I saw the, uh, the English language, you know, version of one of the local papers. Uh, um, I didn't read it in the news item, but I saw an ad and uh, the ad actually it was from Mitsubishi. And they were marketing a, a dryer. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it was not the dryer. So I forgot. Uh, it was washer or dryer. I think it, it had a deodorant uh, cycle. Okay, and deodorizing cycle. That was the only thing that was different from a regular one. And so it costs some extra uh, number of yens. And essentially, what it does is. Um, 
uh, you go to the bar, pick up a lot of uh, you know cigarette smoke, uh, alcohol, you know smoke, and what it is is you really don't have to you know completely wash it or use detergent or whatever. All you want to do is just deodorizing it on that cycle. Um, you know that's that's what they were you know talking about effectively doing it, and I, obviously from the ad I couldn't get it. And then the next trip when I, when I went, I went and picked up the brochures and they didn't explain. And then I sent an email to somebody I know in Mitsubishi and you know, uh, they didn't work in the division. But the second hand information I got was that they were using uh, nanoscale titanium dioxide particles. And uh, But the thing is, if you think about it, actually, you cannot allow the you know, clothing to come into contact with the you know, titanium dioxide particle. There are two things. One is actually if it picks up, it constantly depletes the titanium dioxide particle and that's a waste of uh, uh, resources. That's one thing. And the second thing is you know, then you get exposed to the titanium dioxide, which could be even more problematic. And uh, so it, it looks like the way this one works is uh, the titanium dioxide it has is done like a coating and then it is sitting somewhere remotely and then you have the uh, the air passing through and that actually picks up the smoke and then you know goes there and loses uh, because the titanium dioxide particles have a large surface area it they are effective you know water absorbent comes back and so that's that's actually a pretty clever approach and pretty safe appro approach too so uh, that's what actually Mitsubishi uh, you know markets so so there are a couple of ideas it's just combination of talking to them and then trying to figure out so that's uh, in real products which emerge from companies sometimes it's kind of hard to find out what exactly the secret sauce is. Uh, Jin Zhao, I'm not sure if I said her name right, Jin Zhao was saying this afternoon <coughs> that you control the uh, electric conductivity of the nan nan nanotubes depend depending on how they fold it, what axis they got yeah. folded fold around. How does one control what axis they get folded on? That is, a, that's, <laughs> that's the biggest difficulty. There are, there are an awful lot of people working on it right now. And um, uh, yes, it is, that's, that's one of the roadblocks right now in terms of um, our ability to use carbon nanotube in electronic applications because the electronic application, um, if you're going to use that as a conducting channel instead of silicon in a, in a CMOS chip, you got to have precise mobility and electrical property. If one device has got one uh, uh, rolling or chirality and the other one has another one, then each device will be different and so that's, that's a big difficulty. That you don't have the problem with today's silicon chip. Okay, so the precise control is there. So that's actually is what is you know standing between the nanotube uh, and uh, its uh, presence in the uh, uh, CMOS chip. If, if if I understood the raw material for making the nanotube, they basically we have sheets, single layers. No, no, no. That actually was only a, in a so-called Gadanken or imaginary exper in experiment. Oh. I kept saying. Nobody is seeing their rolling cigars. Okay, that just actually for you to you know to understand how uh, you know the property of a nanotube. It, it, it comes from a seamless the rolling of the tube, but in reality it just happens because the raw material is not graphite. The raw material is uh, methane. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, a large area of uh, biochemistry is called stereochemistry. It contains the concept that molecules can have the identical molecular number of constituents, but they can be of different orientations. Uh, they can be in a left hand or right hand different orientation, which turns out to be a mirror image of each other. Um, in our bodies, um, many medications act as sites. <coughs>
did the Chinese get things so small to put in their pottery? What type, what process did they use to get things that small to change colors and such as you're describing the pottery? Um, I don't know, it could be just, you know, the first act of filing, whatever, you know, when you first started, probably in the first set of articles that came out could be, you know, so, so small, like a powdery thing, that, that could be, you know, I'm just, I'm just guessing, yeah. And uh, certainly they did not actually make, um, you know, gold from, you know, precipitating from something like gold chloride or some other chemistry, probably not. It was entirely possible, just like food the problems they had, they didn't have that much gold to go around. I don't know, maybe they just had only particles. Then. So was it in solution or in a, in a powder form when they put it in? So it was a glaze, I presume? It was a glaze, I think. There's a book, if anybody must read it, called The Arcanum, which is about the uh, how the Europeans, Germans, basically finally figured out how to make the Chinese uh, porcelain, mm -hmm. and the, a lot of the coatings as well, that they finally figured out how to do some of those things. I don't know that specific, whether that specific one was... Yeah, I don't know whether the civil be based, but yeah. Yeah, actually, eventually the Europeans figured out uh, what the... But they, there's a lot of... People underestimate, I think, how much experimentation went on, though. And some of it's, of course, some some effects are going to be serendipitous as they're going along. But I think that they're feeling that in the you know three four thousand years ago, people weren't doing experiments. I think they clearly were uh, with the materials. There was no way that they could have come up with these things. Yeah, but it also you know, see what to do is you know we don't know the status of science and all of those things. I mean, we have a good feel for how you know how things were a couple of hundred years ago in Europe and so on and so forth. But we, I don't, I don't know much about history, but I don't know whether we have a recorded history of the status of these things in Asia. Okay, because I mean, if you look at some of these things, actually, right now some of these things uh, keep coming back uh, since the emerge of, uh, emerging of Asian powers. But they say actually, so you know, far back, um, um, by the time the English uh, they invaded India and all that, in those days actually it looked like in the world, you know, the two thirds of uh, uh, the uh, the entire world's GDP was uh, between India and China, okay, and European powers had, there was no U.S. at that time, and the Europeans had only about 20 or 25 percent, and uh, uh, India and China had about, you know, two-thirds, and then the rest, you know, the rest of the world, and um, so obviously something must have, you know, gone on, and uh, whatever their version of science or... Uh, uh, there's, this, there's this other thing that, it, that the science, as it was conceived in university was something to be shared, whereas engineering knowledge was always tended to be secret. And of course, then if there was a big war and invasion, a lot of this stuff just got lost. Somebody just came up with something that was in India, apparently there's some herb or something that, that uh, counters malaria. And it was like, you know, there was this one little group that knew about it. <laughs> Obviously, uh, they didn't do a good job of it because that's the first thing you get when you get there, so they don't know much. <laughs> people started going back through these records for natural substances that would uh, you know, stop the malaria. Well, yeah, of course somebody had one and it seemed to work. Now they're trying to, of course, find a, something slightly different than it so that it happened. Yeah. It's pretty clear that the, uh, the Chinese machine. stole everything from the Indians and the, uh, the Europeans stole everything from the Chinese. Right? Yeah, it's actually, I mean, it's not clear. But see, see there are some, I, I don't know whether anybody ever made those things, but what it is is I vaguely remember reading Okay, this is all you know, really old uh, you know, literature. And they were equivalents of the heat-seeking missiles and all of that, you know, they were talking about in the old literature, okay. I mean, which were about, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of years old, okay. Uh, but only in this century, you know, we were doing heat-seeking missiles and all of that with high tech, okay. Some manifestation of some of these things, God only knows what they did. It's a, actually, these things, are, uh, yeah, these things are really fascinating, you know. But it takes a lot of time to uh, to uh, you know, sit down and sift through and understand and, and interpret a lot of these things and get the right context. One of the things in history of science, you know, I feel they, the, the documents that have been, for the European stuff, which is the one we, we work on, was uh, 
there's a certain number of his, you know, like Kepler's documents and you know, Copernicus, and they go through all these various things and the history of electromagnetism and stuff. And then you start thinking about the, the engineering stuff. And apparently there's probably 10 times as much literature in engineering. And they used to, they didn't call it science, and they, it was down to them called rest, recipes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And recipes. Well, I mean, it was the engineering. It was how to actually produce something, how to actually make something happen. But these were not, you know, in, in the university system, they weren't considered science, so they haven't really been brought up. So it's just, I mean, there's a vast literature of very, very interesting things and very, very interesting techniques that really were just not, had not been recognized in the 20th, 21st century. I guess I'll, I'll I have a question that's, that is uh, modern parallel to that. I usually try to figure out somebody, I usually had at least two questions, but I try to find a polite way to ask them together, but <laughs> not, I'll ask them separately. Uh, you know, the, the, this is my editorialization. It seems to me that over the last few years, there's been a number of technologies that have been counted as possibly revolutionary changing the genomics, proteomics, uh, recombinant DNA technology, so uh, uh, What is your opinion with regards to nanotechnology, aside from this washing machine, a deodorizing washing machine, <laughs> where, where will be the first technological application where we will have a real device, a real machine that does something based on that technology. They're already there. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. they exist, right? Yeah. Some of them. Well, what it is is, um, <coughs> if you if you take a look at this, um, you know, the GMR-based, uh, you know, magnetic uh, devices they use for storage. That's purely nanotechnology work. Okay. Um, the IBM's uh, GMR-based you know, technology that that has already happened. Uh, but a lot of other things it, it is going to take uh, a time. Um, See, part of the thing is it's, it's it usually, whether it is nano or micro or macro, if you look at the history of technology development, uh, things have always taken, you know, minimum 10 years, if not longer, you know, from the moment things are conceived. You take a look at actually mm -hmm. even the Internet Revolution, okay. Um, it, it DARPA funded this way back, okay. Um, for about 20 years, you know, nobody even heard of it. See, the, the, the difference between then and now is, um, you know, today we are in the internet era, you know, which is uh, plus 24-7 cable and umpteen number of magazines and a, an awful lot of uh, um, ways to disseminate information. And all those people, uh, they have to fill their pages, you know, whether they are web pages or whether they are uh, cable news time or whatever, because they got to sell commercial, right? And so they got to have content. So people are constantly calling, you know, the scientific community as to, hey, what's going on? And uh, and um, so so that that fast information that in a dissemination, uh, you know, puts some kind of a pressure, and uh, yeah, on the community, and that's what I was, you know, the, the thing that I was talking about about mom are we there yet? But in the in the in the past, actually, there was, I mean, New York Times had a science section every Wednesday, and you know, ninety percent of the uh, country didn't read New York Times. Okay, so that at that time, that elite read about it on those Wednesdays, and that's about it. And there was no pressure, and um, most people didn't even know that DARPA funded internet. Most people didn't even know that they were they were working on it. Okay, so they left the people in peace, and, and it got done. Okay, and then on one day, finally, ah, it was there, and. Uh, um, but that's not going to be the way it is because today everybody is watching over everybody's shoulder. That is one thing. And that actually what it is, is in a free society like ours, that also leads to a certain level of hype because in a competitive world, uh, every professor wants to get on the local newspaper. Okay, because that, that, so when somebody calls, then, you know, that the, the natural enthusiasm and, uh, 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 all of those things, you know, lead to, you know, simply overstating some of the things, okay? Global warming. Uh, huh? Global warming. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll come to that in a second. So, so that leads to the reason, you know, so that, that's, I think, in my opinion, is the origin of that, you know, hype. 
and um, so we, we in that sense some of the big things uh, like the uh, uh, like the personalized medicine or or some of the uh, you know the composites and all of these big things it, it is going to take yeah, about 10 years or so but we have seen some big things for example that the GMR based you know the memory the large you know the, the, in the, in the storage and all of those things are already there okay it's pretty big yeah the you know things like tennis racket and cosmetics and that's all trivial but actually it's trivial for you and me because we, we, you know, we are so used to thinking about high tech but for those people who are raking in the money it's not trivial because you know, as long as it's not coming in pesos and it's green dollars and they make making tons of it, hey, you know, they're happy about it. Some of those, yeah. also like those water purification things and stuff like that, things that will attract certain particles and nanoparticles in surface areas. stuff. Yeah. That's a, that seems to me potentially huge. Yeah. Clean water. Clean water yeah. And stuff. Uh, actually, the, the Israelis are putting a lot of effort into, you know, desalination. Historically, they've always been number one in desalination yeah. and they're uh, trying to do even better. Okay, and I'm sure they will come up with something fabulous. Well, I, I can't resist mentioning that we have one, besides FEI and Intel and HP, one local example of a small company that has a recognized award-winning nanotechnology for preventing biofilm formation on medical implants, such as catheters using nano silver. It's called mm -hmm. Acromed yeah. um, in Beaverton. They have FDA clearance for a technology based on silver nanoparticles that embed themselves in the interstices of the surfaces of polymers or even uh, metals, stainless steels, that prevent acquired infections in hospitals. That's a nanotechnology, very yeah. useful, very is successful. It, but what it is, is it? Is it, if we go to Providence Hospital, we're going to find these devices. It won't be long because they've got FDA clearance and customers. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm good at the devil's advocate. I understand. No, but you, yeah. you can, I mean, these guys are selling this stuff, so it's common. Yeah, but also actually, again, now that you're doing it, if you go back and look at, um, you know, historically, I was, uh, I was alluding to this uh, at PSU today. Um, you know, there was anecdotal evidence, and I'm looking at um, you know, the past, uh, analyzing the past records. I read about this somewhere and it was pretty interesting. I, I hope I'm not mixing up the wars. It was in, apparently it was in the Napoleonic you know, wars. And they had a very clear record over a long period that the infantrymen were always sick quite a bit more compared to the officers. And they figured out actually the infantrymen were using aluminum utensils and cutleries and all of that, whereas the officers were dining with uh, Oh, you know, sil uh, silver <laughs> utensils, and uh, so they had something to do with it, but nobody has uh, you know, done anything about it. It just took you know quite a while. So there was always a suspicion that actually silver is an anti uh, antibacterial, antifungal, and all of that stuff. Um, but but right. obviously there was no record of patent, patent or anything. So whoever did it in the nano is you know, raking in money right now. Yeah. I have to ask you, uh, just getting you know, a couple more questions I wanted to. <coughs> um, I, I'm aware of an article um, that suggests that, um, uh, first of all, that known that asbestos is a nano size filament, and that they've done some tests now where they've taken some nanoparticles, and I don't know what they were, they were whether they were uh, carbon nanotubes or whatever, roughly the same size as. As asbestos, and they injected them in some mice, and the phagocytes reacted identically to the nanoparticles as they did to the asbestos. Now, that's not all nano nanoparticles, but at least in some cases, we know, experimentally demonstrated, that nanoparticles will stimulate the same type of immune reaction and encapsulation and scarring and so forth that uh, asbestos does. And Given that this is a multi-billion, tens of billion dollar industry, I, I worry that the incentive to ignore that stuff is huge. And uh, so I'm wondering what you and Skip and others are, uh, how, how you, uh, when you go to bed at night, you think about the people 50 years from now who will be dying from uh, the nanoparticles that, uh, anyway. You get to get yeah, but what it is, is actually one other thing that, uh, one other thing that, uh, I would advocate is that actually we even set aside something like 10% of our research dollars 
to investigate the safety aspects of, uh, of, uh, of uh, all these nanomaterials, okay? And um, yeah, I've always said, actually, knowledge is power, okay? Forget about nano for a moment, you know, whether it is micro or macro, okay? Every material manufacturer, when they ship something, okay, whether it is on a small package or a 50-gallon drum, they are supposed to send you something called material data safety sheet which says blah, 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 all of that, okay? That means actually they have the obligation. And we have, actually all civilized countries, they have at multiple levels, uh, you know, regulation agencies, federal level, state level, even local level, okay? Um, you know, just because I'm the U.S. government, in my lab I can't use boron trichloride. I need permission from Santa Clara County, and they treat me the same way they treat anybody else, and it takes forever to get approval. So we do have things in place, okay? Uh, just because we have something coming nano, uh, all of a sudden, actually, I don't know why, you know, that, that without even knowing, uh, we can't ask for more regulations. I mean, we can't be just trigger happy about regulations. We've got plenty of regulations in the book, okay? I mean, people still violate, you know, regulations, you know, making fertilizer, and they dump some of the things, actually, in, in the local river. And um, so, you know, people could do the same thing with nano, too. Uh, but that you can't have a you know bra a broad you know brush stroke saying it's all bad. Okay, the important thing is whether it is nano or micro or macro, we have an obligation to generate the knowledge. Okay, and it is important that we force the companies to generate the knowledge. Okay, regardless of bottom line. And uh, any material which actually has got bad rap and it's got b bad properties, carbon nanotube as wonderful as it is. Uh, if it is proven, it's it is the next asbestos. You know, it's just goodbye. That's that, that that's that's what it is. Okay. I worked on nanotubes for eight nine years, but I would be the first to jump off the in a train if I know that it is. But at this point, do I know it is bad? You know, I'm not capable of you know sure. making the test. Um, and the right people, that you know, the the toxicologists and others have to study. I saw one study which I thought, even though I'm not a toxicologist. I still thought that was an idiotic study, and uh, because what it is is, I think they pumped in so much um, nanotubes down the, uh, what do you call, tracheal tube or uh, the tube, yeah. But what it is is, yeah, I asked the question, if you shoved that much, you know, sugar down the mice, it would die, okay? So then can we turn around and say sugar is bad, okay? I mean, so it's got to be a mini, it's got to be a meaningful experiment, okay? And it has got to be a controlled experiment, it's got to be thorough, and it's got to be unbiased, all of those things. But what it is, is once again, actually in free societies like ours, actually all elements are at work, okay? So people who are after profit, uh, you know, they could do something, but what it is, is we have, you know, regulations and we have agencies, and, and that awareness well, has to be there. Agencies. What I'm concerned with is the, in the asbestos story, and in several other stories, uh, Brockovich's story that I get that all the regulations were there, all the oversights were there, so I get it. It wasn't about regulations and oversight, it was about individuals. Yeah. And it was about their moral yeah, standing exactly. and their ethics. Yeah. And what I'm just saying, and, and you know, I know you guys are good guys and stuff, and I just want to raise it so that when you're in these meetings that you understand. Yeah, you know, I, I do. Treated, I do. That there's fifty billion dollars of funding coming down here. Yeah. And there's such a huge incentive not to look carefully. Yeah, I, I do understand, but what it is is actually... Or when you see a little thing, you don't yeah. like, well, that could be a problem, but, you know, we've done what we had to do in regulations, so... But what it is is, but the thing is, the problem is, none of us have a way of stopping that one or two or three individuals, sure, whether sure. it is the Aaron Brock of story or asbestos or whatever, sure. what, you know, none of us have the thing. So, the alternative is like what Prince Charles says, okay, and let's put an end to it. I mean, that's actually going to the other extreme either. If that's the case, we would not have had the computer chips, we would not have had. So, you know, you, you no, just get caught between these two things. Individual integrity. Yeah, and, and that's uh, all I'm encouraging is you yeah. guys just to reflect on it and be aware of the mistakes that have been made in the past. Yeah, but what it is is if you take a look at actually, I, you know, uh, I, I once asked, my wife is an artist, so I asked her to draw this cartoon once which I use. Right from the beginning of the civilization, everything, you know, human beings invented, you know, there was always a negative use for that, okay? What it is is I asked her actually to draw a cartoon of two, you know, a couple, caveman and a woman, and then um, it's just actually, I mean, 
um, it's too late, I can't remember. Basically, the first thing they did was actually the sharp stones so they can get fire. But you can use the same thing actually now, you know, to stab somebody to, you know, to death, okay? And that was the beginning, so. Yeah. This is a little different though. Those are weapons. Those are weapons. Yeah. I have oh, sure. Sorry. Two All right, go ahead. I, did, I love my uh, my uh, my host, but um, good. <laughs> I'm involved in in hype. I mean, right now I'm trying to write a piece, and uh, some of the some of the uh, source I I I, I stutter. I apologize. It'll take me a while to speak. Okay. Okay. But uh, some of the hype that I'm going to write, uh, write, uh, write right now is that even though there are 350 products, consumer things, you can buy as gifts right now, supposedly based on nanotech. One of the fears is that we're going to have a reaction against it if there's any whiff of the downside of the risks, and that could end much of this consumer engine that's trying to uh, drive them. And the other hand, you got someone like Ray Kurzweil. I mean, I, I probably mispronounced his yeah. book, his yeah. book. And he's talking, you know, his, his thing right now is if you stay healthy for a few more years, well, nanotechnology will be the bridge between computer and human technology so that you can have man these nanobots in your bloodstreams to repair everything, and you can live forever. He's got a book out right now about how to live long enough. Let me get to watch out for when he's going to talk. But the other thing is, you no know, one's talking about the dark side. I mean, <coughs> it's interesting that, that, that our host here brings it up, and, and you brought that up too. I mean, even the kids, the, the, the end of your head. The spy bots, the spam, you know, the various dark things that are going on right now. The shame humans, I'm not worried about technology so much the human beings who are doing it. And where, yeah. what the new dark side is. Yeah, but <coughs> that goes back to what I was saying that sure. right from the beginning of the civilization, everything we invented, there was always a negative side, okay, from the firestone. <coughs> but if somebody had put a stop to it at that time, you know, we still would not have invented Matchbox. <coughs> Can okay. I swipe that thought? A high school student research program in the summer, and um, mm -hmm. uh, we get uh, every summer maybe about 15, 20 students and uh, high school students. Um, I, 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 the first year actually I was getting students, uh, this was 10 years ago, first year I had students coming all the way from Rhode Island and other places. But that actually turned out to be a total nightmare, and I stopped it the second year onwards because most of them were 16 and 17, come and they couldn't even drive, and Bay Area is a nightmare. And we have no public <laughs> transportation. <coughs> I ended up buying four or five bikes the first year and giving it to them, but then I was worried that they're going to get killed, and it was just it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't worth it. So we stopped doing. So the second year onwards is Bay Area kids, and the parents drop them off and uh, and then pick them up. So at least. I know somebody has the responsibility, and uh, yeah, all I got to do is to take care of them after they get inside the fence, and not to worry about the fact if they're getting killed on El Camino Real. And, uh, so, um, so, so how long, like a, like a ten-week program or something? Yeah, it's a ten-week program, and uh, I think we pay them probably a buck more than McDonald's, uh, but I, I, I imagine it's a lot more challenging and interesting than working <laughs> in McDonald's. Yeah. yeah. That's probably we should wrap it up. Any questions? <laughs> no? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.